there's many more places where we need to spread the love and stop them from breaking apart our communities. And BLO is here to tell you about that. What an introduction. We love the UUs. I mean, no, for real though, like we, there's lots of people who we try to work with on a local level. There's lots of people who we try to work with on a national level. And we love the UUs. And I think that energy is a reason for it. I think the example that you heard set is a reason for it. And I think we were asked to share some of the lessons coming out of Arizona last year that we take into the work that we continue in our own communities. And I think really the lesson of solidarity is one that standing on the side of love models on a daily basis. And so what I want to share is not so much what, what our opinion is, but more of what we've been able to observe in, in the UU's work and how you all have engaged in this movement to reflect that back as something that we can all share. Because what we know is that we didn't stop it in Arizona completely. There's still a steady march forward toward hate, and it has been spreading, right? And so really, on a national level, what the lack of a pathway to legalization has done has created a, a dilemma for all of us, where we have to choose whether or not we comply with these laws, or whether we refuse to comply and stand on the side of love, stand on the side of human rights, right? And it's easy to look at Arizona and say that this is a bad apple state, it's a rogue state, it's, it's on its own, right? There's people who say, you know, let, let Arizona secede, the rest of us are all right. But really, Arizona was created by the federal government, right? It was actually created by two things. 1070 comes out of a federal commitment to criminalization that's decided that undocumented folk are better treated as criminals than human beings, right? It also comes out the conditions for 1070 were created by our own commitment within the migrant rights movement exclusively to a DC strategy where we thought that if all we have to do is convince Congress to give us legalization, then we'll be okay. And what that did was neglect the field. What that did was neglect our own communities. And what that did was take away the voice and the power of directly affected folks and try to put it in appealing to the hands of politicians. And so when a law like 1070 gets passed, instead of having spent years of building a base and spending years of building strong community infrastructure and institutions, we spent years pleading and lobbying and weren't in a position of strength to be able to bat it down right away. And so the conditions from 1070 are ones that we now face, where the idea of exchanging enforcement for legalization has now left us with nothing but enforcement, right? And what we see in Arizona is really two visions of the country. One of them is Jan Brewer's and Russell Pierce's and Sheriff Arpaio's, a vision of hate and attrition. And another vision is the one that we've been building together and we see blossoming in the body of defense committees on a daily basis of inclusion, of love, of self-empowerment and self-determination. And really, in times of economic crisis, all of us are presented with that question of how do we wish to be together as a people? And one way that our states are deciding to go down is the path of Sheriff Arpaio. Another way that all of us have the responsibility of making it is the path that you all have heard today that Puente, Endilan, and the UUs are walking together, right? And so how do we engage in that in each and every one of us? Because it's a question of what is my part? And I think especially as, as a racial justice and an economic justice movement for people who come from a place of privilege, for people who may come from racial or economic privilege, there's often a tendency of coming into a community to adopt its culture, right? Like Chuck D, you'll see my age. I'll represent the, the actual young people on the panel. <laughs> Chuck D is an MC. He, he led the rap group Public Enemy. And he said that um, white people often use communities of color to be the spice in their other, otherwise bland existence, right? And so firstly, what we need to know as we do cultural exchange is what we each bring to this, yeah? And what the UUs do, what we see you all doing on a daily basis is you come with your own sense of value. You come with your own sense of identity. You come with your own sense of spirituality and grounding and core, and you bring that to the exchange. So it's not a relationship of me coming and taking from your culture. It's us coming together and sharing our cultures. And when you know why you're in the room, you know where you're going, and you can't be swayed along the way, which is a difference. 
I think along those lines, when we were doing, when we were talking about 2012 earlier, people said, but we're not ready for a Justice GA. Like, that's a lot of responsibility, right? And I think as we get involved in anti-racist work, as we get involved in the work of justice, a lot of it is often, how do we do this right? How do we do this perfectly, right? And I don't think any of us are asking for perfection. What we're asking for is partnership. And knowing that there may not be a right way to act, but these times are calling us to act. And so how do we do that together? And so I think for those of us who, who often were told that our voices are powerful, who see ourselves reflected in the leadership of the country, a lot of it when it comes time to do social justice work is how do we lead by following? How do we find the community, be in support of it, and come with all of our brilliance, all of our skills, and all of our ideas, but do that in service of the people affected? How do we lead by following? And whose leadership do we choose to follow? As you'll, as you'll see, as you probably know, the, the migrant rights movement, most movements, are multifaceted, have a lot of personalities, a lot of different decisions and opinions of which way to go, where and how. And so it's important to me, I think, to put out and reflect it in your all's practice. Again, you follow the directly affected people. Those who are most affected by the issue are those who need to be lifted up into leadership to decide how that issue is resolved. And those of us looking for solidarity need to be in solidarity with those communities themselves. Not their spokespeople, not their advocates, but the community, the body of defense committees themselves. And we need to do it in a way that alleviates suffering. Our folks are suffering hard. In Arizona, what we talk about, one of the reasons why we've invited you next year is because there's a world of disbelief. That if we said that there's a tent city where a jailer keeps hundreds of people on, on, plat, on plywood beds, and it snowed in Phoenix this year, and it's 110 degrees in the summer, and that's happening here in the United States today, there's a world of disbelief where all, our filters don't allow us to believe that. If I told you that when Sal Reza checks his phone, one in five phone messages on a good day is a death threat, and two in five or three in five is more likely, that's hard for us to believe. When we say that the day labor center, humble people who have crossed continents to be able to provide for their families, have to cross through lines of armed Minutemen just to be able to look for a job where they may not be paid at the end of the day, that's hard for us to believe. And so what we've done in inviting you to Arizona is trying to shrink that world of disbelief so that we can pop that bubble and not allow it to exist anymore. And that that immediate suffering can't be used as a talking point for somebody else's long-term or legislative gain, that as we're doing these partnerships, we have to find ways to alleviate that suffering immediately, whether that's stopping a raid, whether that's getting someone out of prison, or whether that's changing conditions so that somebody gets paid at the end of the day. And I think as this has spread to Georgia, to Alabama, to Indiana, we saw it get defeated in Florida and other states, but we know that this was, has been a test round all along. We have to commit to each other to continue to be shocked. Last year in Arizona, the world was watching. We talked about how we were on the front page in Japan. This year in Georgia, it's not the same situation because we're we have language for it. We've seen it before, and when it's the second time around, somebody's sophomore appearance, the sequel to the movie, is never as powerful as the first, right? But we have to continue to be shocked, and we have to refuse to get used to hatred. We have to refuse to accept the hatred that we've seen spread throughout this country as normal, and we have to do it in a way where we're weaving together sacred reciprocity. What you all talked about is coming in individualistically and seeing how we take care of each other, that's, what, that's how we roll, and that's what we have to do on a local level as a community, on a state level, and on a national level as a movement, knowing that your struggle is my struggle. And when there's a flashpoint where I'm calling for help, I need you there. And when there's a flashpoint where you're calling for help, you better believe I'll be there with you. And so that's, I think, the partnership that we've created and that we're happy to walk together with. <laughs>